Jackie, you can, you can. Uh... Right, cool. You ready to get started? Sure. Okay, so I'm really excited. Hi, first off, I'm Jackie Hudspeth. For those of you who are just coming on, some of you may know me. I'm an MBA two this year, um, concentrating in business analytics and finance. Um, just so I'm actually really excited to be here today to introduce my boss, who is a uh, McGill MBA alum of '96, Jack Young. And so uh, Jack has a really, really wide breadth of experience that didn't actually start in VC, but did end up taking a few turns into it. So uh, he started out um, as an operator and then eventually a marketing manager and a product manager for companies such as Nortel, GDC, 3Com, Amber, Nokia, and then eventually became the country manager um, for the US in sales and marketing for ZTE, which is the Chinese telecom and then eventually broke into VC after a decade of cutting his teeth. Uh, and he went to the Qualcomm Life Fund uh, where he was a managing director for um, over eight years. And Qualcomm is a early stage corporate, invest, uh, corporate VC where they invest in digital health. So they uh, invested in things such as you may have heard of Fitbit. Uh, so that was, that was under Jack's reign and uh, <laughs> Then he got to really play around with corporate VC models, single LP, and then eventually wanted to start something that was a multi LP model and got the opportunity to do that with Deutsche Telekom. So he had uh, a couple years ago, about five years ago, uh, st uh, joined on with DTCP and built this incredible uh, venture capital fund that I now have the pleasure of interning at. And they uh, now have over $1.9 billion in assets. And that's broken down into a private equity arm, a venture capital arm, and then they still have an advisory that uh, still works with Deutsche Telekom, but DTCP is in and of itself its own entity. So Jack has worked in early stage and late stage, has a breadth of experience that um, we're really excited to go ahead and dive into today uh, and talk about the differences in, in the VC atmosphere in both. So with that, Jiro, I think I'll give that to you. Perfect, thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Um, Jack is, uh, again, another example of uh, one of these people that has been uh, hugely influential to me, especially in my development of uh, my VC course. Um, and uh, at this stage, one of the things that he's become, he's become really go-to, almost, you know, like definitionally so, uh, for me on, on, on two things that I'm, that I think are very, very important within, uh, within the subject. Um, one is really thinking carefully and systematically about, um, enterprise SaaS and more generally, uh, thinking about uh, how you assess, uh, recurring revenue businesses. Although, you know, again, his, his focus really is in the enterprise SaaS space, uh, at least, uh, during his time, uh, in, uh, DTCP so far one of the categories I just, I always love hearing what he has to say about that stuff. And then another category, uh, Jackie uh, touched a little bit on it, is um, his thought process around fund design. Incredibly creative, incredible clarity of thought around that stuff. Um, and really thinking about how you design your focus and you design aspects of your fund to differentiate yourself uh, from the crowd, which was extremely important for Jack early on in his career as a VC, where he had to basically build his brand and his reputation. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk uh, and to cover uh, a bit of both of those things uh, today. And we'll start with uh, giving Jack a chance, not so much to answer my questions, but to directly tell you guys about his perspective at uh, Deutsche Telekom Capital Partners on enterprise SaaS uh, and late stage investing uh, we're really lucky. Um, Jackie and Jack uh, prepared a short presentation, and I think the best thing to do is to just let Jack say it like it is. So, uh, please go ahead, Jack. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can you can everybody hear me? Okay. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. So as uh, as mentioned, that I uh, I came to DTCP about uh, five years ago. Actually, it's interesting that. Starting with a joke that you saw I'm wearing this vest, it's just DTCP. So we, we give to one of our partners and uh, he took it to Walmart and at the checkout, the register says, that's a lot of acronyms, DTCP, VCP. The only thing I can read is 
advisory, right? So uh, DTCP certainly come from a long way. Uh, we started as a spin-off from a Deutsche Telekom as a company. So it started with a single LP, uh, but it was pretty clear from day one that we are set to build uh, a different type of company. Um, we have become uh, more and more independent from a single LP and now morph into multi LPs. So back to the story. So in 2016, when I was given this opportunity, uh, you know, kind of switched back to the dark side, right? I was doing a lot of healthcare, which is kind of an interesting early stage. And then I was given an opportunity where uh, the fund has been raised. That was 250 million euros from Deutsche Telekom. It was pretty much a clean sheet. And they were asking me what I should be doing or how should I lead this fund if I would be given the opportunity. And it's just dawned on me right away. I think the background is, if you imagine back in 2015, it's probably many of you still in high school, where uh, the most significant things happening back in the, in the middle of 2015-16 uh, is uh, there's a leadership change in Microsoft, right? Satya took over the, uh, uh, the CEO position. And one of the things that he bet on is that better on cloud computing, right? So, so you know, cloud computing is not a new thing. Amazon sort of started about even 10 years ago, but it really, at that moment, it becomes a, a, a huge endorsement. As you know, uh, Amazon and Google is fantastic with lots of, uh, you know, business applications and whatnot, but Microsoft is certainly the king in enterprise, right? So when they made that endorsement, they're gonna go to cloud computing, people took notice, all of a sudden the government agencies and et cetera, they're comfortable with, because they're comfortable with Microsoft, they understand the securities, et cetera. So, so really that to me, that's a, a fundamental shift and we were early on to spot that momentum, we, we know this is a coming, right? So uh, early on 2016, we basically bet on the trend that the enterprise software it's kind of a similar to what you have going through as well. In the early days, you have to buy software and download. You probably not, and they've gone through this process. Most of the applications today are run in the, in the cloud, in the web, right? So your computer is pretty straightforward. And same as enterprise that going through that, you used to have to buy a lots of computers and put it into your data center or your basement. Now all the computers are just like utility. It runs in the cloud. So that's number one. Number two is that, you know, software used to be, sold as you know license right so just like the old days would buy cds and nobody does that anymore right so everything is going to a subscription the beauty of subscription is it goes those ways right because one has become more predictable because you expect it to pay x amount of money and some some of us may be grateful for that but from the receiving end as a company it's much more stable right if i started with 10 million dollars i know next year if i keep my customer happy I still have the 10 million, even though I lose 10%, I still 9 million versus if I sold you 10 million hamburgers this year, next year after starting from zero, right? Unless you, you are in the, in the eating club that I can get you a monthly. So that's a, that's a big thing. And the third thing is that, so, so those are the things that we saw back in 2016. One is moving into a cloud computing, right? Second is moving to the subscription. And the third thing is that we find it was interesting is that it used to be when you have a large company McDonald's or Bank of Montreal, they would have gone to IBM or SAP, buy this huge amount of software customized for them, right? And then it takes a lot of money to maintain and uh, lots of cycles to, to, uh, to, to making that decision. So it turns out today, there is just about a, an app for everything, just in the enterprise, the same as a consumer, right? If you think about travel, there's this app, there's expenses, this app, just like you can download all the apps on the app store, Enterprise today have those choices as well. So, so one day when you join the workforce, you actually are very much empowered because as a manager or as an analyst, you actually can, using credit card, buy software and improve your productivity. And if you like it, and you can actually, you know, recommend to the company and eventually bubble to the boss. A good example would be Slack, right? Some of you have you, have you used Slack? You know, Slack, you can download it for free, right? So, so that's how they started. They, they, they let you use it free. And by the time a couple of people liked it and uh, the department starting to use that and as soon a few departments are using that. And then the Slack as a company would have come to the company like McDonald's, for example, and say, hey, you guys have, you know, have 50 credit cards on file that you're paying me. Why don't we lump together and making a large sales contract, right? So, so that's the beauty of the third model, which is a lot of these point solutions over time, taking a grassroots 
and then over time, you know, aggregate. And the beauty is, as you probably see, some of you have taken computer courses that is something called API. So software is talking to software, right? So, so if you have a point solution, now you can morph into a, a gigantic um, solution tailored specifically tailored for your for your company. You can pick and choose, right? Versus in the old days, you go to IBM, you have to write so-called product requirement, and then they give you one solution specifically work for you. Versus today, you can pick and choose and assemble the best uh, solution for you. So all these things are happening um, kind of, a, you know, in a, in, a, in a, I would say five, six years ago, we started to see that thing happening. So as a venture firm, what you're looking for is these seismic shifts, right? So, you know, people made lots of money when iPhone was introduced, right? So there are lots of money to be made. And when Facebook had become a platform, again, lots of people made money, right? And same thing as the cloud computing made money. Now this time alone, you probably don't recognize some of the names, for example, when first iPhone came out, everybody knows there's Instagram, there's Spotify, everybody knows that. When Facebook came out, again, they built a bunch of applications, the games, like all the things they built on Facebook. When the cloud computing happens, lots of things are kind of happening, but you probably won't know. But but if you do, you know, some of you probably trading stock, if you look at some of the stock, obviously Zoom, everybody knows that, right? But there are companies named a, like a Datadog, Atlassian, those are not a, consumer um, face brand names, but these companies have an incredible journey, right? It typically takes them at 10 years that they went from zero to over $100 million in revenue. And over the time, this is companies that traded $10, $20 billion, including some of the Canadian companies, right? Um, so that's been a very good uh, um, spot. We have uh, uh, spotted back in 2015, and we were able to write the tailwinds. And then obviously this year, we all know we went down back and forth in the lockdown mode, right? Instead of sitting in a classroom, I see all of you sitting at home, everybody's on Zoom instead of everything else. So same as think about all the people that work in a company, right? All of a sudden before you can do whiteboard, we can do sending paper, it's not possible, right? So everything's going to, the acceleration of digital transformation just being accelerated by multiple years. And we're very happy because at the time we thought this is coming, maybe it's a five to 10 year, uh, a trend that will, will sustain all of a sudden we cut it by two, three years, right? So this pandemic has brought us together and given an opportunity for companies. So as a result, uh, we are very happy that, you know, our, our fund uh, has been performing very well, especially um, these companies focus on the business. And we don't learn a lot during the, the, the course of time, which is I think part of this discussion that we're gonna carry out is what we have learned um, uh, not only look at the investment, you know, obviously we, we, we talked about in a hot area, but how do you pick the winners in a, in a hot area? Because whenever there's, there's, there's a hot area, there are lots of capital come in, so create a lots of companies. So it's really, uh, you know, takes you a skill to find, you know, what's the most interesting company, right? How do you find the next Zoom? How do you find the next, whatever the company that we, we aspire into? So, so those are the kind of things. Uh, for me, I think the journey is it's just getting started, right? So we're five years into that. You know, we are into a second fund, and we're in the process of raising a third fund. And our firm now going from uh, five five years ago from zero to forty, including interns everywhere. So we're hoping to continue to grow, and it becomes hopefully um, building the firm into a, a multi generation or multi decade uh, franchise, and one day maybe. You know, your kids will open up and say, hey, yeah, I spoke to that guy, DTCP, crazy guy, 20 years ago. And by the way, this is a, a huge successful story now. Yeah, mute, Jero. Thank you, Jack. I'm still learning how to use Zoom. Um, so I know you guys have a presentation. Do you want to give a little bit of a rundown of that presentation? Because I think there's some... Um, really wonderful uh, systematic ideas around thinking about how you evaluate the promise of a, a, um, a SaaS company uh, here, um, especially okay. Antoine. So, yeah, I'll get started and Jackie, feel free to chime in, right? Because yeah, okay. it'll parts of this uh, exercise as well. So first of all, we said the DTCP when we started in 2016. So let me just give you a little bit more background. And I, I want to ask this question. How many people either watched the movie or read the book of uh, of uh, Moneyball. I won't judge you whether you watch the movie or 
let's see how many people. Oh, there are a few people. Um, okay, so that's good. If you do have a time, I think it's a fantastic movie to watch and star Brad Pitt. So, so, so why I'm bringing this uh, money ball into, into this discussion is that now imagine in 2015, 16, right, when I came to Sand Hill Road, which is a Sand Hill Road, as you know, is a major league, right? So you think about, you know, imperfect analogy to a baseball. It's the major league and you have the who's who is the benchmark who founded Uber and the Sequoia founded Facebook and whatnot. So, so, so when you go into, even though you can op open an office, we're fortunate enough with enough money to open an office in Sand Hill Road, we're still considered to be a new player, right? So it's really hard to, to, to play the game that, you know, you're not quite established. So in a money ball situation is that obviously Oakland A's, which is a smaller market with a limited budget, so you have to do something a little bit different, right? You, you just can't play the home run and get the, the biggest star into your team. So same thing, right? When you're starting a fund, you have to think about that. You can't just go say, hey, I'm, I'm going to compete with Sequoia. There's no chance, right? So, so, so what we have done is we, we try to find out some area that we can land and we can start. So clearly we have land, we have fine enterprise software. It's just getting started. So we caught the right place. But the second thing that we want to do is something a little bit different, right? So some of you have probably having approached with investment opportunities or some probably have gone through these case studies. So most of the venture capitals, you know, you met a company and they're pretty early, right? Maybe even five months into that, maybe four years into that. And most of the, 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 the thing that how you value the investments is, you know, the tra traditional way you look at the, I think they call, the, the, there's just people summarizing the 5 a.m. So I, I, I don't know if I can recall all 5 a.m. is uh, marketing, management mode, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so these are money or these things are typically evaluated. So, so what happened is that because we, we, we decided to focus on SaaS and one of the thing I talked about SaaS is there's a continuity, right? There's a description model. So it's a pretty easy for, uh, you know, you try to focus on this type of company and try to developing, try to gather the data and using a database data driven approach to analyze this company using the financial models, right? It's because most of the companies are kind of a similar because their the common goal is the same to sell a piece of software to a corporate, whether it's a, whether it's accounting software or communication software, you have to convince the other end buy a software from you. And more importantly is buy a software from you to paying the subscription. So, so hence we know that, that's the case, and these are the area the company we focus on. So what we have done is systematically gather lots of data from uh, from these companies. So the the model that we have uh, developed is this thing called the flypath model. So why why it's called flypath, right? As you can see the instrument here. So analogy is this. Now imagine if you are um, a SaaS company. Let's say you know you, you graduate from school, you decide to join a SaaS company, or even starting a, a SaaS company. So typically, as I say, these company has a journey. The most of the, uh, 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 most of the people believe that the SaaS company, in order to be a, a class one company, that you need to go from a zero to $100 million in AR, which is imagining as annual annualized recurring revenue, to 100 within 10 years. And if you do that well, you should be able to do that with $100 million in capital raise. So, so that's kind of the journey, right? So, so the analogy of thinking about that during that 10 years journey is think about if you're a commercial pilot and you were told to reach the, the, the flying altitude of 35,000 feet in about 30 minutes. So the control tower probably can call you in, in, in five minutes into the flight. They go, hey, captain, where are you? Tell me your, you know, your altitude, your speed, and where you're heading, right? So the captain probably going to report back to a bunch of numbers and if they are normal, the control tower say continue. But if you five minutes later and say, you're still on the ground, the control tower, I'm sure gonna have a conversation with the pilot say, hey, what the happens? You're supposed to be like, you know, 5,000 feet, why are you on the ground? Or, or why you, you, you know, you're, you're traveling at this crazy speed that you're only five minutes into that, right? So the same thing here, that knowing that there is a trajectory for the company to go from zero to hundred million dollars in 10 years that we call that flight pass, uh, like a cruising altitude, when the company come to see us, we are venture capitalists, right? We obviously look at the companies that are typically pretty early, maybe three years and five years into the company. But what we can find is that we can actually look at the instruments, right? Look at a bunch of numbers and say, hey, by the way, you're three years into this company. You, you actually already, you know, spent a, 
you know, $5 million in R&D, $13 million in sales marketing and blah, blah, blah. And let's see what you have done so far, right? So versus the company tell you, hey, this is the next, next best products. Oh, by the way, we have won this awards. We were like featured in this magazine. You know, that's all great, but show me the financials, right? So, so basically that we have developing this instrument, we can look at the financials doing a forensic and we can tell, oh, by the way, this is the way you are. Now, how do we know? The only way we know is by comparison, right? So the beauty is that we have built a database of 300 some companies. So the company comes in exactly, right? So you can see, so the flight path. So if your company from a zero, let's say your journey in this case, you're, you're starting, let's say you're in year, year, year two, you, you got a, a $4 million AR and then in, in eight quarters uh, that you go from a, a, a 5 million AR to 20 million AR. So we can compare you how your ramp up journey versus the company that we know in our, in our, in our model, which is a dash line here, which is called the Mendoza line, which is not our model, but we adopted this common model as well as the co cohorts of these other companies. So quickly you can see from this angle, you go, Hey, this company is growing very well. This looks like a company A, which is a winning company in our, in our uh, portfolio. All oh, this company is not growing at all. That, you know, looks like a trouble company, right? So that's just one area. So Jackie, if we flip to the next one, uh, so, so that's just one thing that, but we looked at the multiple, multiple of these instruments, right? So some of those are, are, are basically provided by the company, some of the, the calculated certain ratios, et cetera. So because we have this model, we have 300 some companies, we can quickly benchmark against the, the known quantity, right? We expect you to be, you know, these, these numbers maybe sounds fancy to you, but if you look at it, it's pretty basic magic number basically measures your sales and marketing efficiency. So we can say how many dollars you spend, what you expect you to generate the revenues, right? So we can compare these numbers. And then what happened is you'll see on the right automatically score based on the model that we know, right? So, so taking the guess game out of it and it becomes a very non-emotional, right? So the company comes to us, they all like to talk, right? But for me, I can't wait until they go to page 22, which they're gonna talk about financials. So that's how we started, you know, we want to see how the company are doing from the instrument perspective before we listen to the sales and marketing pitch. I'm sure as a sales and marketing, as a CEO, you're very good at telling, you know, if you're 30 minutes presentation, 25 minutes, you're very good at telling us the story, visions, all the other good stuff. But I'm really focused is I want to turn around. I want to focus on the five minutes that what you want to tell me, and I'm going to spend the two hours to understand now you are three years and five years later, you have spent the investors $20 million. Where are you in terms of delivering these hard numbers, right? And how, how these compare to the known company we know. And then think about this methodology is very powerful because it's, it, way, it, spent, it, it cut down the evaluation process much faster, right? Because otherwise everybody can argue what I, I mentioned about as a company with five M's, right? The management team, the market, this and that. Everybody can argue everything, but if you just focus on the money, and that's a pretty binary thing, right? Either yes or no. I mean, obviously there are these ratios, but, but everybody will be on the same foot. And then through that, you know, our operation is uh, much more efficient. And also we, we, we now can give a company a pretty good feedback, right? Because most of the time the, 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 the company is, you know, they talk to lots of investors and people keep on asking information without giving feedback. And we, in turn, very quick, we just tell them, like, hey, our model may not be perfect. By the way, if you look at this 5M on the money aspect, that's exactly how we should feel about it. And I'm sure that's, that's agreed by many investors. Probably they don't have as much of a systematic way we put presenting it. But sure, that tells it a story that how these facts, how these, uh, how these numbers are playing together. So maybe Jackie, I mean, since, since you have been working on lots of these numbers, maybe you can give me a little perspective of how you learn about that and how you feel about how we do certain things within DTCP, which is quite different from the other. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I think the, the year before I came to work for you, uh, <laughs> I was looking at a lot more early stage uh, and doing impact investing and in these, these types of projects through the school. And really that is a bet on a team and a hope and a dream and uh and just hoping that that the that the right team is trying to solve the right problem but i think with dtcp it's very it's very focused because you're focusing on stage and sector 
the stage being growth stage, the sector being B2B, SaaS, technology up and down the stack. And, and because you have all of these quantifiable SaaS metrics, ones that I had to learn on day one, <laughs> um, I did not know what ARR was on day one. Uh, but once you start learning the, the jargon and understanding what the ratios are, it does become very, very clear uh, what companies are doing well and which ones aren't. I remember um, about a couple weeks into my internship with you, I, this was, you were like, it's like a diagnostic. It's basically going into the doctor's office and based off of a PNL, if we can, if we can run the numbers, uh, you, can, you can say a lot about a company because of how they spend their money. So yes, okay, they're growing. We love growth, investors love growth, but if they're, they're doubling their cash burn in sales and marketing, are they really being that efficient? And you can tell that from, from um, sales and marketing or sales efficiency metrics. So you can have that conversation then with the company as to why are you spending so much on sales and marketing? And they can either come back with a good answer that works for you, or you can say no. But generally it's a really good indicator. And so there's just, the finances become this diagnostic test at this at this stage and in this particular sector that that tell you whether or not it's going to be a good investment. And so, like you said, it's Moneyball. You're going for base hits. If you have the 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 numerical data to back it up, you are definitely taking on less risk because you know that the company has a track record of of performing well. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of uh, tying back. I forgot about the money ball I started and then I forgot about <laughs> talk about the analogy of a home runs versus the base hit, right? So, so the DTC being methodology, think about there's a pyramid, right? So it, it helps you to weed it out those ones very quickly versus, you know, you spend lots of time. So let me just give you another ana analogy that you will appreciate. So it, for, for a moment, imagine, you know, uh, like an MBA scout, right? We're going to school, we go, let's say we go to McGill, we're looking for the next CBA player. Let's not even call NBA players. So when you walk in that gym, you know there's a bunch of people playing there. They're probably aged 19, 20 years old, right? They are playing and I'm trying to find next, you know, CBA star. Clearly I'm gonna focus on the, the kids who's like 6'2", 6'4", you know, probably like 200 pounds and can jump, right? And, and those are the people that I should be focused on versus, you know, maybe in the gym, there's a guy like me, 5'7", 150, right? So if an MBA scout, why am I going to be talking to Jack? You know, there's no chance that I'm going to make a 19 years old at that stature or ever make the uh, MBA scout. Now, there's one of the 100 chances to do that. But versus a kid 6'4", can jump 40, 40 inches, it's probably a good 50% chances that he'll be doing well. So that's basically the methodology we're using here as well. There are lots of companies. So we're looking for the obvious signals, right? And you're three years into that, like you're 19 years old, we expect you to be a certain way. And if you're a certain way, then let's let's talk. Otherwise, you're not for us. That make sense? Absolutely. Um, you know, maybe um, I'd like to synthesize a few of the things that both uh, Jack and Jackie have uh, brought up, because I think it fits actually relatively nicely with some of the stuff that I talk about in, uh, especially my VC course. Um, so just to kind of summarize, you know, some of the juicy bits, I think, that we've uh, gotten out of this uh, presentation. Uh, Jackie, could you uh, show uh, slide four in, uh, in this presentation deck? So two things that I want to point out, like to me, this is the key slide in the presentation. Um, and there's two things that are really, really interesting and fascinating about this. The first is the data sources. Um, this is one of the important sources of the key edge of DTCP. They've done something that I haven't seen any other VC fund do, which is they've taken very seriously the idea of building a proprietary database of the performance of private late stage enterprise SaaS companies that are doing well. Um, you guys might have seen in my course that I do it with SaaS companies that have gone public. This is a better database. I wish Jack would share it with me, but I'm not asking Jack. He's just, a, <laughs> it's valuable for sure because no one else has done it. And it's actually a potential source of advantage for their fund because now it can act like a magnet for people to want to present to them. Because one of the things that Jack and Jackie can do is they can give people the scorecard so that they know what, um, uh, how they're doing, right? And every time someone comes to them, they give them a new data point. 
because they have to show them their financials. So we can see a little flywheel effect that starts to happen, okay. right? People want to come. It makes their database even better. Now people want to come more. Brilliant. I love it. Um, the other thing I want to point out is the second panel, the, you know, where you've got growth pattern, net retention, capital efficiency. Think about this in the context of our classroom discussion on unit economics. And if you think about the key drivers of unit economic calculations that we did in class, those are the ones, right? So what they're doing is very similar to what we discussed in class on the context of unit economics. So I really love this slide. Uh, another nice thing that was touched upon uh, by Jackie is uh, talking about the distinction between um, early stage investment and late stage investment. And, and I'm sure um, Jack will agree with this, which is, you know, Jackie mentioned, you know, with early stage, you focus less on the numbers. I mean, there's no historical numbers really to work with. You focus more on the team, right? And so there is a bit of a sense of what do you prioritize, right? In my VC class, I introduce a framework for thinking about projects and a framework for thinking about people, right? And one of the things I talk about when I talk about weighing these frameworks is, you know, how do you weigh projects versus people? My view is that you weigh people relatively more. It's not a zero one thing. It's not binary, but you weigh people a little bit more early stage because you need the right people who are going to be able to adjust to any new, any information the market gives them about needing to discover things like product market fit and go to market fit. Right, you need to be experimental. Not everyone is experimental. It's okay if you don't have the perfect project yet because there's too much uncertainty anyway, right? And then later stage, you've kind of zoned into the right thing. Now the numbers start to matter and you've got enough numbers that you can start thinking more analytically. And the fact that Jack has done this, this really analytical approach, um, you know, really when he's transitioned into late stage, as opposed to when he was doing things in the early stage, he was doing things a bit differently. It's rather remarkable that he's been able to reinvent himself that way and in, in a very uh, logical and, and, and clear manner. Um, but I think it speaks to some of these things that we have discussed in class. So hopefully that makes some of the things I teach a little bit more uh, believable even. I mean, some of them I actually learned from Jack. Um, so, you know, maybe I can ask a couple more questions, Jack, and yeah, then sure. I'd like to open it up for student questions. Um, so, yeah, maybe Jackie, we can uh, take that presentation off the screen so we can see each other better. Thank you. Yeah, actually, you know what? I think, because I have received a few questions sent by students, so maybe even before I ask, you know, one or two more questions, I actually want to go straight to students. I want to give students as much of an opportunity as possible um, to engage with you. So maybe uh, first question um, is, is a question that was sent by Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, maybe you, you can send the question. I think it, it, it's a nice one to ask in the context of this discussion. Okay, um, well, thank you, Jack, Jackie, and Jiro for organizing this event and being here. Um, so my question is, especially when we're looking at late, um, later, like, uh, term, I guess, um, funds and determining whether or not to invest, and you're using this flight path, um, analytical data-driven strategy. I was just curious if you could um, describe maybe the most common point or reason why the numbers fail. So this is looking at the investments that don't work out. It's looking at when maybe the numbers don't do justice to the people um, that are, that are uh, running the company. I'm just wondering, like, what what yeah. could go wrong? What goes wrong yeah. when the numbers are great um, and it passes all your tests with flying colors? Thank That's you. Good. So maybe we'll answer the question that two ways. A very good question, right? So let's say why the number is going is bad. Why we reject? And the question is why when the company is good, you know, shall we invest, right? So 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 the thing is, this is what we did, right? So. So, so, so you saw the database, there are lots of data points. Some of those data are provided by the companies, others are calculated. So we are not quite there machine learning yet, right? So we have a bunch of data. We will just look at these new data for looking for signals after we're dealing with 50 to 100 parameters. So we've been looking and looking on the experiment, the experiment, and we find some signals. So in other words, again, I like to use the analogy because, you know, let's say 
we met you and I, I spent a half an hour with you. We know, you, we know you're a pretty disciplined person and you work hard, you work out, you eat healthy. So even if I don't see you for a year from now, I know you probably pretty much look the same, right? Because I know you versus if I see a company, if I see another a person that, you know, he's having a motivation problem, drink a lot, eat a lot of McDonald's, I know a year from now, he's already gained weight. He's going to continue to gain weight, right? So the same thing as a company, think about it. When they come to you, the company has been running all those years, right? Three, four years, they have a certain cadence. And so you can calculate the it's in, the, in the shorter words, like in the, in the, in the, in the health analogy, I give you the BMI, right? If the BMI is 20, next year, you're probably between 18 to 22. If you are disciplined versus if you're not disciplined, you can be 20 and going to 30 the other way. And what happened that most company come to you, this is what they do. A typical CEO came to you. They go, Jack, Jackie, well, we are running a fantastic company. By the way, this isn't so far. Next year, all of a sudden, I'm going to from BMI 20 to 10. I'll be a super athlete. That's what the typical the invest the investor will come to you because they want to impress you. They go, "Hey, I did all the things. Uh, next year, I'm gonna all of a sudden become a superhero, right?" So here's the interesting thing that you know from we just had an interaction. In order from a BMI from 20 to 10, that's a Hercule effort. This guy is gonna be super disciplined. He's gonna do something extraordinary. Otherwise, my bet is he's probably gonna be between 18 to 20, right? So the same thing as the company. They, when they come to us. We're looking for those derivatives. We're looking for the signatures, right? We say, hey, if these numbers tells me like this, chances are I'm pretty good. Again, venture investment, we're not betting 10 years from now. I'm betting two years from now when, how they're able to go to a market to raise another fund, right? So I have a pretty good chance of that. So looking at you, do an, all the analysis for the last two, day, two years, just look at your numbers and talking to you. I have a pretty good idea, this company in two years now, how that will be. So, so that's the question. So again, go back to that, right? So looking at the, the athlete, I'm looking at the guy who is 6'4", 6'4", 200 pounds and eat clean food, right? Good lifestyle versus I'm going, versus some other company comes in, you know, he's 5'7", and he's already overweight and he's going to tell me he's going to change his habits, right? So, so the key thing is that when we look at these companies, we, we're looking for these, the numbers and look at the hygienes. And then obviously, once you pass that hygiene, which is a 60% of the evaluation, you do spend time, right? Then you spend time, well, how about the competitions? What are un unknown things? And these are the things that the 40%, every VC does that, right? They checking all those other parameters, try to, back, try to, try to solidify your, your investment uh, pieces. But, but what I'm saying is that I'm actually surprised not too many people are doing this kind of data, discipline data-driven model. Now, I understand it's difficult for many firms because they don't specialize one thing, right? We had a luxury to specialize one sector and one element. So we're able to benchmark, you know, look into the things with inside. And that mo the model has been working with us and, you know, we're not setting still, right? So every year we get in more data points. We learn from our lessons. We back tested that. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, you know, we continue to improve our performance. Thank you. Awesome. Actually, you answered this really nicely because you actually answered a question that someone already had asked me in private. Uh, but the person actually has a second great question as well. So, Daniel, um, maybe you can ask your second question. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jack and Jackie, for doing this. Uh, I think I just wanted to know, is there any knowledge sharing between yourselves and your digital infrastructure franchise? Do you gain any insights from them to able to kind of do your job a bit better? That's, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, we, uh, as a firm, we do have a two investment class products, right? The private equity and the digital infrastructure. So we actually consciously are distant, uh, set certain distance between the two um, franchises, right? The ventures are very much, much focused on, you know, kind of a mid-stage high growth. We're focused on high growth. Um, you know, a company that has a potential to become a market leader versus uh, digital infrastructure is your typical PE play, right? So you're looking at it, you know, how to debt equity ratios, the, 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 the nature of the, the business, they, they tend to look at a, a pretty heavy short back, right? For example, so one of the deal we just did is fiber to home. So we know everybody's gonna be locking down uh, well, for foreseeable future, right? Internet consumption is gonna go up. So people more interested to buy fiber. So we don't, 
So for now, we actually don't share too many things. Now, obviously, one thing leads to another. We are kind of leading indication of these five Gs and you know fiber to homes. Uh, but in general, you know, we're kind of running two separate tracks of the investments. Okay, thank you. Ashley? Hi, um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you um, have any insight into why you think Zoom blew up so much when I personally would have expected a company like Skype or an established company to really take over the market at this time. So I was wondering if people in the industry uh, saw it coming and um, why you think they did so well. That's a good question. And I actually had a fortunate met was Eric Yuan back when I was in Qualcomm. So it was 2011. And that's the same question everybody goes, well, video conferencing in 20. 11, there's so many of those. Um, so I think a couple of things, right, which has actually worked well and then also sort of backfired to, uh, to, to, to Zoom, as you can see uh, later on. So, so one of the things that we, we know why video conferencing failed, because the user experience, right? It takes a long time to log in. The experience is not that great. It's very hard to learn and, you know, all those things, right? So Zoom, by far, is the best. It's the user experience. They just work so naturally to the things that we like, just like Apple, like my, why Apple is better than the Android phone, no offense, but some of the people like an iPhone because it's easy to use. I think the key is to make it user friendly. That's the key differentiation, right? So, so what Eric has actually done, and he admitted, he cut a lot of corner, right? To, to do what we need to do, have the seamless experience, that's why they were backfired, um, you know, once it becomes a mainstream, right? There is hackers, securities. So in order to make it easy, you sort of have to cut some corners to make it user friendly, but then, you know, becomes uh, a de facto uh, application and hackers and malicious attacks starting to gain against you. So now they're starting to have a catching up. As you can see, Zoom actually sometimes becomes painful now you have to admit somebody, passcode, et cetera. Now, in a perfect world, we would just want to click, and here, here we go, right? Um, so, so to answer that, I think, you know, um, so that's one of the things, I think the key thing is that they, they saw the pain point, and they introduced the product, and unfortunately, you know, they have to re-engineer that as much as they can, and just happen to be, we all hate, another thing, we all hate the passcode, right? How many passcodes do we have, but do we have a choice? Thank you so much. Mike, you have a question? Yeah, thank you so much, Jackie and Jack, and thanks, Jiro, for, for orchestrating this for all of us. Um, my, my question is, given the established players on Sand Hill Road at the time when DTC, DTCP kind of um, also set up shop there, is there one critical thing that you think DTCP did right to build the company into what it is today in comparison to like that, that heavy competition that would have been faced very early on? Yeah. So, so one of the things that I actually, a lot to do with one's experience, right? So I think that's probably the live lessons that I learned. So, so when I was in Qualcomm Ventures, and two, I joined Qualcomm Ventures kind of late in my career, I joined a venture fund 2008. Uh, my initial thought is that 2008, if you recall, that's the iPhone first came out, right? I don't know any of you actually using a candy bar or some kind of feature phone, a Motorola flip phone before that. I have lived through that. When iPhone came out, I go, oh my God, this is fantastic, right? And then, you know, Qualcomm is a company that's behind lots of, they like the Intel for smartphones. So I say, that would be a perfect place for me to like get myself into the venture because venture is all about investing in new things that Apple just created this fantastic platform and there's gonna be lots of money to be made. I was right, except I was also wrong as by the time I get to uh, Qualcomm 2008, everybody else realized that, right? So when I got there, I realized I have no advantage. Not only I'm new to investments, because you just have to learn at the venture. But secondly, I was late to the game. Everybody already saw that coming, right? So, so that gave me, uh, I was pretty disappointed, to be honest. After two years, I thought I had this, you know, this advantage, but I don't. So quickly, I was given an opportunity to, to invest in something else, right? So one thing we mentioned earlier is about healthcare. So what we try to do at the time was invest in so-called the digital health, using smartphones and wearables to changing one's behavior. I realized that's fantastic because 
one, I came from a technology space, especially I have very good understanding with the mobiles and evolution. And I was able to spend a good one year to study healthcare, right? So healthcare is very different uh, from the tech, the IT and healthcare are two different domains and few people can do in the middle. So, so in 2011, 2001, uh, 2011, I was given an opportunity to start this Qualcomm Life Fund. Then I realized it's great. It's a small pond or a small hill. And I was able to quickly become the small kill, king of the hill versus if I'm trying to compete with other people, there's no chance, right? Again, it's similar to the money ball cases. So, so, so when I came to DTCP, I realized the biggest mistake that you will make is you taking a course from Stanford, VC 101. What they're going to tell you is how Sequoia Benchmark built their venture fund. And you took that and you go starting a Sand Hill Road Fund, trying to mimic what Sequoia Benchmark, just like you play baseball, you go, I want to be Yankees. That you're going to fail 100%, right? Well, not maybe 100%, but 99% you're going to fail. So we realized that there's no way in hell I can just go into Sand Hill Road and all of a sudden go, hey, DTCP, you should come to see me right after you go visit Sequoia. No chance, right? That's not going to happen. It takes multi years. So the only way that would work is repeat what I have done in the past, specialize something, right? So you build on a tiny little sand hill and you try to be say, hey, if you want to do X, Y, Z, come to the sand hill. And, and that's what we did. So basically, as Jackie mentioned earlier, we try to focus on enterprise software. We try to focus on growth stage. So by the time you tell people that's all you do, the world's starting to come to you. They go, hey, you know, if I have this idea, I got to talk to Jack and Jackie. But if I'm doing the healthcare, this guy Jack has betrayed us. We're not going to talk to him about healthcare anymore. It's just like startups, right? Startups are disruptors. The right startups will. They'll find a, sec a section of the market that there's a huge gap, and then they'll try to infiltrate it. And VCs work very much the same way. It's just they're doing it from the investing side. If you try to be like everybody else, you're just going to get completely drowned because it's a very, very crowded space and it's very competitive. Yeah, I really love uh, both Jack and Jackie's answers to this question. And it really, uh, you know, I would almost, uh, for everyone here even, uh, you know, we're going to post a recording of this uh, eventually. I would even review uh, Jack's answer to this question because it goes straight to the heart of um, um, something that I think is, is, is incredibly impressive about him, which is that really that's that mix of self-awareness and a focus on how to differentiate himself from the marketplace to then make himself appealing to the right type of investments and to think what do i need to do to make that value proposition credible right it's uh it's pretty awesome actually right uh serge you have a question yes uh thank you jack and jackie once again for the event uh, i had a question more so like clarifying question on uh, the dc DTCP model that you guys use. So is it more than just like initial screen as to, okay, we're going to pursue uh, into a due diligence stage with this company, or is it like tied in throughout the whole process as in like a company with a great score can potentially merit like a higher multiple, like a premium or uh, yeah. is it linked or? No, that's a fantastic question. In fact, if we were, I was having exchange with one of the, uh, the investors in our fund, they asked the same question. They go, Hey, your flat pack, flight pass fit test looks impressive, but do you just using at the front end or, or otherwise? So the answer to that is actually we're using in all three phases, right? The first thing that we do, we model what we're looking for, right? So, so the venture, the way it works is that, as you know, we typically look at a 50 to 100 company making one investments. So, so time is precious, right? Because there's, think about it, if you want to invest, if you talk to, you know, 100 company, that means two meetings a week. You want to spend your energy on, on the, um, sourcing the quality deals. So the fly pass model basically tell us how to looking for these companies. So the other thing, dirty trick I didn't tell you is that, that you know, again, all these things are interrelated. We said, hey, year three, year five into the company. That's typically the stage of the company we're looking for. The first thing actually we do is we go on to LinkedIn and we look at how many people is in that company. Again, if you're three years or five years, let's say five years in the company, we expect you to have 100, 120 people. We know that number, right? We expect you to earn a certain, and we know if you have that many people, your, your revenue run rate will be like $15 million. And that's what we're looking for. And if you don't, then if, you, if we LinkedIn says the company have 30 people, we won't call you, right? So, 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 that, so that's the front end, the very beginning, because we, we are looking for a model that fits. 
And when the company came in, they do a data dump to us and we feed back to them. So the second thing that we use is that now, so that's all theoretical, right? So now we have 26 companies. So every quarter, the numbers we track from the company and we benchmark against the companies. And it's pretty clear which company is doing well, which company is not doing well. The company is doing well, does that fit the model or does not, that does not fit the model. And oftentimes we use that to enhance the model. And so that's number two, right? So we're using that in our operation. And number three, it was just actually interesting is that we know some of the company as a, it's not every company as a, you know, venture, like probably 20, 30% of our companies that deviate from the model. So what we do is we actually go back to the company and say, hey, look, you know, this is the story you have told us and this is what you did. And here's what went wrong. Maybe you have a leaking uh, gas tank. Maybe your wing flap is off. So we can tell you pretty much precisely. And one of the first projects Jackie was working on, that's exactly like that. The company hasn't done well. So we look at it, the data forensically, right? And then try to go back to the CEO and say, hey, look, here's obvious things. You know, something is wrong because the common behavior we see from portfolio company look like this and you are doing why, then, you know, you should think about it. You know, they maybe you have a good explanation, but oftentimes maybe it's just a, a wrong assumption that you have. So to answer the question is the model is centered to all aspects of our investment journey, right? From the sourcing all the way to manage that. Um, so it's been, become a very powerful. And I think that's, that's the reason that I think everybody in team, they all pretty much spoke the same language, right? Because it's, you know, imagine that it, it's hard to argue that these, the data driven model that with so many data points, it doesn't hold some truth to it. So, so one thing that I want to leave with is I think it's fantastic in, in today's world, right? Lots of people talk about big data and I'm a truly believer that data that actually tells you a lot. So I would encourage you uh, and, you know, many of you are early in your, your career development and really think about it, you know, in a data rich world that you're going to encounter, right? The automation going to what is the most important currency is to understand the data, right? So if you, if your data does not speak to you, I would actually spend more time to think about it. One thing I do all the time, I tell you a little trick, every time I go to a restaurant, every time I go out to checkout, I guess that number. I always do, because what happens is you train yourself, your brain, try to get that, and you have the sense. Now, oftentimes, if you tell me something, I can actually guess that number pretty well. Believe it or not, your, 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 your brain works mysterious ways. So I would highly encourage you that maybe lots of you are very artsy and you think that data is dumb and you know stupid but going forward that's all it is if you think about ai where does the ai come from it's all data maybe we can have one more question jack uh, a bit of a detailed one actually uh from bruce hey first off thank you uh Gerald, for organizing this and thanks jack and jackie for your presentation so I actually have a question related to Fastly, the company you recently take to IPO. Yeah. So me and my group member are pitching a stock called Cloudflare, which is a key yeah, competitor. Yeah. Yeah, key competitor to Fastly. So my question is for high growth um, cloud computing company like Fastly and Cloudflare, how do they uh, accelerate new customer acquisition and leverage new technology like s secure access service edge infrastructure in a very competitive way. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a pretty good question that uh, we are reflecting as well. I'll tell you, the, the, here's a thing that actually kind of beyond our imagination, right? So when we first encounter, we know both Cloudflare and the Fastly, right? A couple of years ago. So, so, so if you think about the entire um, um, so, so they all started with the CDN, right? Content delivery networks, right? So the entire CDN, uh, the market is about $6 billion a year, something like that. And it turns out that, that Akamai, which is a company that started in MIT, has about a 30, 40% of market share. And they were trading at the time about 12, $13 billion, right? So, so imagine here's the biggest player, and they were going 15, 20%. They would trade at 12, 13 billion dollars or like four or five times or six times of their, their revenue run rate. And how the hell that you can imagine, I just looked at it, right? The Cloudflare is $20 billion, right? So they're like, 
not even maybe 10% of the market share and fastly and not too far behind, like 12, 13 billion dollars. We would have never able to imagine that, that that will be, you know, the, the challenger now become a bigger market share uh, than, the, uh, than the incumbent. And, it, and, and it's, it's a much, even though it's a much smaller uh, uh, the revenue stream. So the thing is they're, they're growing very fast. So, so why it's fast is basically leveraging what I'm talking about, the cloud computing, right? So one of the things I think that Fastly and uh, Cloudflare did very well is, is machine to machine, right? So, so let me give you a Fastly as example, why they're doing so much better. So, so if, you have, um, if you're CNN, you know, you want to like, do some live events and the way it used to be, I'm, I don't know, I, because I, we've been out of the company for a while now, used to be the way it works with Akamai, the incumbent, let's just call it incumbent, is that you have to send in a work order, right? Yes, yeah, you as a programmer say, hey, tomorrow we have this live event. So by the way, can you increase my bandwidth from 10 megabits to 16 megabits? And they'll come back and say, oh, no problem, we'll do that, right? So what happened is these companies came out, this technology was invented 20 years ago. That's how it's been the case. And versus Fastly and the newer company, what they do is they know this thing called API application program language. So it's a machine to machine. They bypass this already. So they have set a contract within the machine says, Oh, by the way, your company, if you want to go from 10 to 20, we don't have to talk about it. You can just do it with a machine. So, so that's basically the differences between the company and that. Now imagine that that becomes a lot faster instead of going through the, the human process, human gets involved, make a lot of mistake. The machine to machines are a lot more honest. Now the side effect of it is a lot of people are going to be out of job, right? Because it used to be you got to pay $15 just taking orders, but now that's going away, right? So that's just one example of that, how these companies was able to leapfrog um, the incumbents. And that's why more and more these companies get disrupted, right? Because when you open a newspaper, I'm sure, uh, well, I shouldn't say newspaper, I'm sure when you graduate from school, your number one choice is not work for IBM, right? When I graduated from school 20 years ago, that was the case. I want to go for work for IBM, I want to work for Bell Canada, right? Now there's, Bell Canada offer you a job. You go, oh, okay, well, what's next? <laughs> so, so those are the things, the technology today, especially the one that I mentioned about cloud computing, the data-driven AIs, basically taking a lot of these, you know, human involvement out of the loop. So you need to think about how can you make yourself relevant? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. I know you're an extremely uh, busy guy. Um, so I don't know if you are, immediately needing to run to something else. Um, do you? <laughs> I always have, yeah, I do have, uh, oh, another, did, right? but I can take a, one more question or if anybody has any final thoughts. Does, we can. Well, um, Kanish, do you want to ask a last question? Because I had uh, kind of sure. you off on it, so I might as well let you know. <laughs> Sure, so my, my question was actually around LP structures and how a single LP versus multi LP structure actually impacts the day to day operations within a fund and how that impacts your investment process. Because I'd assume having all your eggs in one basket can be very good or very bad, depending on that relationship. And then, but also another downside of multiple LPs is having to uh, communicate with multiple LPs yeah. is, can take time. And so, how that impacts. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We're learning that, right? So there's lots of pros and cons. Um, as one of my friends told me, they have a single LP. It's a single LP fund. I was just complaining about the things that I have to do. He goes, every time I raise a fund, that means an email for me. You know, every June, you know, or every couple of, a couple of years in June that he writes an email, he gets another set of money, right? Then that has been the case if we would have stayed with DT. Now, the problem with that is, you know, um, unfortunately, DT is an operating company, they're not a bank, right? So it's very hard, you know, we managing, we managing today $1.7 billion. As, as an asset manager, you want to grow the AUM and DT just not, a, it's not a, uh, you know, they don't have the balance sheet to support us, right? They're very generous already so far for giving us hundreds of million dollars and suddenly we return that. So, so in our cases, by the ambition and the ability of single LP, that's not a sustainable way. So the only way to do that is growing outside the, 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 this, this relationship branch to multiple LPs. Now the challenge is that, as you just said it, right? All of a sudden, it used to be we have a conversation, a civilized discussion with DT every three years, you get another set of capital. Now it's a constant battle. I realize that everybody is both a buyer and seller at the same time. 
So I was just having a discussion with my partners. One third of my time, actually part of the things that Jackie's doing, that's what we do. We're talking to the LPs and we try to get smart people into our, into our uh, funds. And then hopefully we can, uh, you know, get more people. And that's the only way we can grow our fund size, right? So hopefully, you know, now we're managing 1.7 and in a few years, we're probably going to be managing four or five billion dollars. And unfortunately, it, it, as much as I want to talk about these forward machine learning, it's all relationship. You got to spend lots of time, you know, talking to people, you know, educate them, get them interested. And I, I, one thing that I learned in the last couple of months of doing that is the differentiation really matters, right? So if I'm not yet another Sand Hill Road venture fund, they go, why you? Why not somebody I already know? And when you're able to tell them some, some different story, they're starting to listen, right? So not everybody's going to buy into that, but at least you have a different angle. I think that's another thing that, uh, you know, you and everybody has to think about how you can make yourself differentiated from, from everyone else. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Well, thank yeah. you. As always, Jack, thank you so much for um, offering us such an amazing return on our time in terms of learning. Um, you know, it's one of these things where we wish we could go on and on uh, <laughs> by night time. Um, I know that you like to be efficient with stuff, uh, but again, just um, on the behalf of myself, the university, all the students, both who are here live, but who'll also have an opportunity to watch this in the future. Um, thank you so much. Uh, this was awesome. And thank you so much to Jackie as well. I'm uh, so excited uh, for the work that you're going to be doing going forward as well. You know, one of the things that I like to tell people is one of the most important things early on in your career is to have an amazing boss. And uh, I think you've uh, very much lucked out. But I also think uh, Jack <laughs> lucked out to have a, an amazing, uh, uh, an amazing, I'm not sure is the word pupil, I should probably learn some basic words in the human, in the, in the English language, but maybe it's a pupil, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but thank you so much as well. You were, you were awesome here today uh, as well. And amazing questions on the part of all the students. Uh, yes. I think this was loads of fun. So um, thank you so much, everyone. And, uh, you know, we'll have a, another event of this type in uh, two weeks uh, where we're going to have an uh, entrepreneur who had a very successful ed tech um, SaaS company, actually. Not sure if you heard of them, uh, Jack, Freckle Education. They got uh, acquired by Renaissance Learning about a year and a half ago. Uh, the founder of that company, who I view as being uh, one of my go-to people for customer development, uh, his name is Siddharth Kakar. Uh, he, um, uh, he was my ex-student in Northwestern, so he's gonna come do a customer development exercise with us as well. Um, but uh, thank you so much for active participation in this. And of course, you know, the, the most fundamental thanks uh, goes to, to, to Jack and Jackie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank Bye you, there. Professor. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Really love the series, by the way. This is, this is super cool. I'm going to, I subscribe to your YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, everybody.